Welcome back to the podcast. I'm your host, Rachel Shepard Ota, and today I'm talking with professional beach volleyball player, wife, and toddler mom, Betsy Flint. Betsy is a six time AVP champion, two time AVCA All American, and is currently in the race towards the 2024 Paris Olympics while also somehow balancing motherhood. Betsy is passionate about empowering women to follow their goals, and I'm so excited to have you on the podcast. Welcome. I'm excited to be here. Thank you. I just have to ask, because I'm not an athletic person at all, I would love to hear about like just your journey with juggling this intensely physical job and also the physicality of being a mom, because just parenting my kids on a day-to-day basis is enough to like make my body completely break down. How do you do that? It's very challenging. I feel like each stage has been hard. My daughter is turning three in a couple weeks and it's been different every year. Um, I finally, we're finally sleeping as of like a couple weeks ago, we're sleeping through the night, which is a big win for us. And that makes (laughs) all the difference for training. Um, is it's, you know, it's really hard to wake up when you're up a couple times in the night or yeah. awake f- for two or three hours, just playing. <laughs> yes. Um, but yeah, I'm very fortunate. My husband helps out a ton. He is, I would consider him one of the, pri- the primary taker for my, um, daughter, which I know your husband recently, um, yeah, I love is that. now the yeah primary caretaker. So It's very challenging, too. He does work a full-time job, but he gives me a lot of flexibility, and I'm able to train all morning. And then I come home, and I'm a mom. And I have found that I am conditioning way less in the gym because I need the energy to condition with my toddler. We're always outside on the bike, running around. And so I feel really good on the court, even cutting out some of that conditioning. So, yeah, it's been an adjustment. It's awesome, though. Where do you guys live? We live in Los Angeles, California. Okay, so you do get a lot of like nice outside time and warmth. Yes. That's yes, great. occasional rain like today, but you can't complain. It'd be hard to be in a snowy place. Yeah, I know. I'm thinking of everybody right now just dealing with winters, and it's so tough when you have little ones that have tons of energy that they need to get out. Can you talk to us a little bit? Because a lot of my audiences, you know, they know me from my sleep page. So they're very interested in this topic. So I would love to hear, you said your daughter's almost three and she just recently started sleeping through the night, which I think, I mean, to me is very normal, right? Um, And a lot in a lot of other places and cultures, it's very normal and accepted and expected. But it seems like here we have this expectation that babies should start sleeping through much sooner than that. So can you talk to us a little bit about your sleep journey with your daughter? Yes, I would say... She's never been a great sleeper. And it's hard when I'm comparing to other people. My sister has a daughter that's seven or eight months older, and she's been a great sleeper since she was an infant. Mm. And it's been hard because that's my expectation of, like, you should be sleeping long stretches. I mean, you're you're two years old. You shouldn't be awake for two or three hours a night. I feel like every time she started sleeping consistently, something changed, something happened, and we went back. And it is, it's hard on my body. Sleep is super important for recovery. Um, So my husband's been great with taking her in the night, but not until recently. And she's almost three. Something clicked where we have, we have the hatch that has a blue light or whatever. You can make whatever color. And we've talked about it for so long. Like we don't wake up. We don't get out of our room until the blue light comes on. And I don't know what happened, but one day it switched and we did travel internationally. Maybe that just flipped her all the way around and something clicked. Um, so not until, yeah, a couple weeks ago did it change and I don't want to jinx it, but it's been very helpful. Amazing. Oh my gosh. I love that. Yeah. Sometimes travel. I, I notice that a lot of times parents are worried about travel, like messing up sleep, but I do hear sometimes about this situation that you just described where a big trip or something like that kind of like resets them in a way. And then they start sleeping or the family like moves into a new house and they start sleeping. It's so funny. It's just, you never know what you're going to get with toddlers and sleep. Cause it can just be all over the map. Even if they were a good sleeper as a baby, it's not guaranteed in toddlerhood. I did a whole yeah. episode on that because it really is so true. So when you're not getting sleep and you mentioned, it sounds like she had split nights where she was up for like extended periods in the night. So 
you mentioned that your husband would be kind of the one on duty. Was that something that you guys have done throughout her life and throughout her infancy? Did she ever go through like a separation anxiety phase from you or have like a preference for one of you? Or how did that all go? Because I know a lot of parents struggle with one partner being like super, super preferred and the other one having a harder time settling for the toddler. Yeah, I would say I have been the preferred parent maybe until the second year I was I was playing and I travel so much. We travel internationally and domestically, I'd say on average, two weeks every month while we're in season. So once that happened, it switched and my husband was the default parent and that was really hard on me. It is amazing in the night when she only goes to him. Yeah. Um, but it is, it's hard because I want to help. And when I try to help, I make it worse. So I try to step back. So it does hard. It's hard. It fluctuates for sure. But my husband um, has been preferred. Yeah. And yeah, I don't know the best way to handle it. Um, I think part of it is that I, I haven't been there consistently like he has. So he is, yeah, the safe one. Yeah. Um, but that, that's been a challenge for us. Yeah. I think it's a challenge for a lot of people. And when one person's traveling or one person's not there, sometimes it's easier for the child to accept the non-preferred parent because they like don't have another choice. And sometimes if you're both available and you're both home, that's when it can be really tricky. How have you managed to like balance not just your training schedule and, you know, all of the stuff that you need to do for yourself physically, but like mentally, how do you find time to take care of your mental health? Do you get time for like other hobbies or is it really just all about your sport right now? Because that's what life looks like. Yeah, I know it's a phase, but I'm pretty much all in on my sport working out and all in on being a mom. Mm -hmm. And I do think being physically active really helps me mentally. The days I get that time to myself to work on myself, I am such a better parent. So that has been really helpful. And I just with our schedules right now, it's been a disconnect with me and my husband. And I just have to keep reminding myself, like, this is a phase, like, she's so young, like, we're choosing to do this, and we're eventually going to find that time to connect. It's hard. We have, we live in a place without family. So it's just us juggling. We have great friends, but you you know, that's different than having family around. I'm fortunate enough that my mother-in-law does work remotely. So oftentimes when I travel, she'll come into town. And she'll work in the mornings. And then when my husband goes to work, she'll watch Cora. So that's been super helpful. I I definitely couldn't be doing what I'm doing without her. So I'm so grateful for her. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, having family support. We have the same thing. We have my husband's whole family is here in San Francisco. And it was even like the deciding factor on whether or not we were going to have a third kid. Because if we didn't have that support system, we would have been like, absolutely not. There's no way that we can juggle three kids, just the two of us, or even, you know, two is, (laughs) it was a struggle sometimes. So that's so nice that you have that because it can be really hard to be away from not only just for the help, but for just like the support system and for your child to have like these multiple attachment figures that they get to grow up with and and that love them and that's such a special thing what lessons have you learned with juggling these two roles and how is it different from life before you had a child how have things kind of changed or evolved and and how do you feel about your sport and the time it takes now that you're a mom yeah I've definitely learned so much I think something that's really helped me is honing in on my why And that's really helped improve my game. Um, Before, I for sure was intentional with practice. But now I'm like, man, I'm taking time away from my daughter, from my husband. Like, I want to make this purposeful. So it's really helped me shift my why. And part of it is inspiring my daughter to pursue her dreams when she gets older, whatever that may be. And just Mm -hmm. to go all out with that. And I definitely want to inspire moms and young women all around that they can continue to pursue their dreams after they have kids. And yes, it looks different, but it's definitely worthwhile. Does she get it? Like, does she watch you on TV or anything like that and kind of understand or not quite yet? A little bit. Like she'll watch me on TV and sometimes she gets upset when I'm gone and sometimes Mm -hmm. they can watch it. 
I think it depends on how she's feeling. And yeah. I think that was a big shift for me. Um, talking to my sports psychologist right after having her, I was worried that she was going to be so mad at me and hate that I was leaving. He just told me, he's like, you, you know, you've got to accept it. Like she's allowed to be mad. She's allowed to be upset about it. And the more you accept it and embrace it, the better off she's going to be and the more she's going to get over it and understand it. So I've, I'm trying to do that. It's challenging for sure. When I come home, I had a time where she like wouldn't talk to me, wouldn't come to me. Like it was so different and that was so hard. It, it hurt my heart for sure. Oh my um, but God. she did eventually, you know, get through it. And yeah, I think it helps our relationship too. Yeah, of course. You mentioned that um, it's important to you too to be like a role model for her to, sh- to show her that you can pursue your dreams and your goals and also be a mom. So are there any like specific lessons that you hope that your daughter or other young girls kind of take away from your experience? Like, I know that sometimes that idea of like, you can have it all is, I don't know, I guess it's become a little bit controversial to say that like a woman can have it all and can do it all. Because the reality is that you do actually really need a lot of support to be able to do it all. So what do you think about that? And and do you feel like you could be doing all of this without a support system? Yeah, I could not be doing this without a support system. It just takes so much sacrifice. But I do hope these young women see that if you're determined and you want to do something, you are very capable. And there's a way it may be tricky, you may have to navigate some things but there is a way if you want something and just to go 100 percent, go all out for whatever you want yeah is this something that was always kind of a dream of yours or did it evolve and and go further than you ever like could have dreamed of it's definitely evolved um just i mean uh, to start i i did want to have kids young and it's very hard when you're an athlete to know when to do that. And the timing was right for us in COVID. There was a break in tournaments and Mm. yeah, it it was still hard. I had those self doubts of like, well, I I still have the same competitive edge. Will my body be able to like recover and get stronger? And once I accepted, like I, those are uncertainties, those are unknowns and there's nothing I can do about them. And I just get to navigate whatever comes my way. And I definitely have not lost competitiveness. It comes and goes for sure. When I'm at home, I'm less competitive. But um, when I'm on the court, like I'm able to just focus and kind of forget about everything and compete. And that's been very rewarding for me. That's awesome. Do you feel like as Cora, your daughter, as she gets older, she'll do more of the traveling with you? Or have you talked about like what that will look like once she starts school or things like that? Because I know you mentioned that sometimes she'll go, um, she'll travel with you, but not always, right? Yeah, I would, I would love it. It's hard on my husband. He does still work and, you know, traveling with a toddler by yourself and I wouldn't be there helping as often would be very challenging. So it's kind of on him, but I do love when she's able to watch me in person and we do get downtime between tournaments and that's the hardest part. Like once the tournaments start, I'm pretty busy with the film, the practices and preparing that it's easy to be distracted. It's right when we're done with that tournament. If we lose, like I want to change my flight and go home as soon as I can. Um, so for sure, I'd love for her to travel with school coming up, hopefully in the fall. It might look different, um, but we will yeah. figure that out when we get there. Do a lot of your teammates have kids as well? Or is that something that you're kind of like alone in, in your experience being a mom right now? We do play two on two. So me and my partner, she's a little younger. She does not have kids, but there are other international players who have kids. And it's cool to talk with them like between tournaments, like, how are you doing? How are the kids? And there's one girl from Brazil and she has a few kids and they were, able to travel to a tournament. And I thought that was so special. They're a little older, so they can, you know, sit there and watch. Um, But that's really inspiring. And there's been a ton of female athletes who are inspiring to me, especially in beach volleyball. So I know it's possible. And you just don't know how much sacrifice they went through until you do it yourself. So I have way more respect for all the moms now that I'm a mom. 
That's amazing. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. So Betsy, you are such a busy mom. I would love to hear if you have any tips or words of wisdom or just insights into how you kind of manage your day or your week as a professional athlete to kind of find time for both training and spending time with your daughter. Like how do you and your husband kind of divide up the tasks and and make it all happen? Finding time to prioritize yourself. For me, I'm very fortunate that my job is working out, but I feel like that movement and just spending the time outside of my house helps me become a better mom. So I'd say that's very important. And we did the same for my husband. We got him a gym membership with a daycare where he's able to drop her off and work out. And at first it was very challenging because she cried so hard that she threw up and my husband was traumatized and didn't want to go back. Uh, But now she's at a place where she really loves it and it's great for socializing. And then my husband gets to spend time to himself. He gets to work out, use the amenities. So that was huge for us. So if people can afford it, I think that's a great place to start. Yeah, that's such a good hack. And honestly, it doesn't even have to be expensive. We used to belong to the Y, just the YMCA here, um, because I was teaching yoga there. And so we would just, you know, go, I would teach my class, my husband would get to have his workout, and we would put our son in the little daycare. And yeah, it's like such a good hack, because you can put them in the daycare. And, you know, as long as that goes well, which every kid is different. Everyone has a different temperament. If we tried to leave my daughter in a daycare like that, it would never go over. But um, (laughs) yeah, but it's it's so nice because then you have that time to yourself and the daycare is like included. You don't even have to worry about a babysitter or anything. Yeah, it's a it's a great resource for sure. Nice. And then what about like um, household stuff? Do you guys have a system for who does what or is it kind of all on him since he's home with your daughter? Yeah, we could definitely do a better job with that. We both are equal in a lot of things, which I'm very fortunate. I know not all partnerships are like that, but we work together well in, you know, dividing the tasks. And I'm very grateful for Chase, my husband, for all that he does, because it is, it can be rare to find someone, you know, like our husbands that will take care of kids and do household things. Yeah, I know. I loved your reel that where you were, um, I forget exactly how you worded it, but you were just like sharing appreciation for him. And I thought that that was so nice. It's a shame that it's kind of like the, it's not the norm. I I feel like maybe it is in, in certain places if it's a little more progressive, but yeah, I find um, when I get questions about like, how do you get your husband to help clean the house? And I'm just like, oh my God, like my husband does m- way more of the house cleaning than I do. And, and I don't know. It just, it works for us, I guess. He doesn't mind doing it, but also, I don't know, he was raised by a single mom and he just kind of like, that's how he was brought up and learned that you have to kind of pull your weight when you're in a household. So I'm glad that you have that support because my heart really does break for moms who feel like they have to do everything. They have to work, they have to take care of the kid, they have to take care of the house. It's just, it's too much for one person. Yes, it is. I know you mentioned you did pelvic floor therapy before birth and postpartum. And I did a whole episode recently with Dr. Sarah Reardon at the Vagina Whisperer. And not a lot of people knew about pelvic floor therapy before. I had so many people writing to me like, oh my gosh, I didn't even know that this was an option. And this is so great. How did you come to learn about it? And how did it kind of help you with your birth and recovery? Because I know that must have been something you were probably worried about where, where, you know, your body is your job. How did that help you? Yeah. My friend is a midwife and she recommended it late in the second trimester until delivery and then going back after. And it was a huge piece of the puzzle for me. I, I mean, I didn't know what I was doing. She helped with the delivery for sure. Just helping me find positions where I can relax in the best birthing position things that I wouldn't have known without going to her. And then for sure, postpartum, I got cleared by my midwives around six weeks. They're like, yeah, you can go work out. I'm like, okay, I can go jump. I can go do everything. They're like, yeah, you should be good. And I go to my pelvic floor physical therapist and she's like, okay, slow down. I know your goals. 
I don't think you should be jumping and going 100% yet. And she slowed me down, which is hard for me. But I listened to her and it's definitely paid off. I play a sport where I'm jumping all the time and I didn't want to pee when I jumped. Yeah. Because I know that can be a thing. So, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And I'm happy to report I don't pee when I jump. That's great. And I'm grateful for the resource. And I think it should be available to everyone. People don't know. know about it. And it, it can be hard to is. find. It's like, yeah, it's like standard care in some countries where they all people who give birth get pelvic floor therapy afterwards. And that's how it should be. Because, yeah, I um, went to like a kickboxing class. I, I was several months postpartum and um, we had to do jumping jacks. And I immediately started peeing when I was doing the jumping jacks. And I was just like, OK, this can't be my life now. And so I can't imagine if my job was to be doing that. And I was on TV, like I would be so worried about <laughs> peeing my pants on TV while I was at work. Yeah, like, I, I can't imagine. So I'm very glad that it helped you. <laughs> yes, for um, sure. And even the little things like reengaging our core, just, right. you know, it gets a little wrecked when you're pregnant. So yeah, just that was, out. yeah, mind blowing just to learn how to reengage my core and build from the ground up. That's so awesome. I'm so glad you were able to do that. Betsy, we're going to take one more quick break. And when we come back, I want to know what's something that no one told you before becoming a parent that you wish that they had. We'll be right back. Okay, Betsy. So to wrap up today's episode, one thing that I always love to ask parents when they come on the podcast is, you know, the theme of this podcast is kind of like what no one told you, what what people should really be talking about more <laughs> to help people who are kind of preparing for, for parenthood. So what would you say is it can be one thing or multiple things, but what's something that you wish somebody had warned you about, told you about, just filled you in on before you became a mom? One thing no one tell, told me was, just the emotional regulation I need as a parent. It can be very frustrating and challenging. And how my daughter reacts is mainly how I'm reacting. So if I'm irritated and frustrated, like it, whatever the situation is, gets worse. So finding ways to calm down and relax myself. And I think the terrible twos get a bad reputation. Like it's a lot of times me that's the issue. Yeah, for sure. We have some unreasonable requests, like what color of cup she wants, but how I react is definitely triggering that. So I think that's something no people don't talk about often. And it is so important for myself and I'm learning so much about myself by doing this. That is so true. I say that all the time too. Like that has been one of my biggest light bulb moments as a parent too, is that it's so much just about me keeping my cool they're going to tantrum. They're going to, you know, do what toddlers do. There's nothing we can really do to, to change that or to stop it from happening, but we can change how it affects us and how we react to them. Have you found any strategies or like any thing that helps you with that? For sure. Taking a step back. It's not always easy. Again, this is easier said than done, but taking a step back and just breathing and just remembering like (laughs) everything's going to be okay. Like we're safe. We're healthy everything is fine. And honestly, what's most helpful is my daughter, when she sees that I'm frustrated or overwhelmed, sometimes she'll look at me and she'll say, be happy. And she smiles. And it's just such a reminder that they pick up on all of our emotions. Like when we're irritated and frustrated, like I want her to be able to see that I have those emotions and then I can get through it and I can find my way to be happy again. And I think it's important that they see it too, that we're not just happy 24 seven or calm 24 seven, but they learn how to adjust their um, emotions based on how we do it. Yeah. I love that. That's so important. Yeah. And like the modeling piece too, right? So, you know, they see that we have an emotion and how do we deal with it? Do we like flip out and like tip over a table and yell and scream? Well, that's probably what they're going to learn how to do too. So yeah. It's hard, especially when you weren't necessarily like raised in that way to have somebody kind of showing you how to feel all those emotions and how to go through them. It's really hard to learn for the first time right alongside your kid. It is. It is. Actually, the the other day she she had this nice dress on. It's supposed to be for my sister's wedding. 
And of course, we were eating in it, and she spilled ketchup on it. And I was like, "No, no!" Oh my God, she's like, it was "Accidents happen." <laughs> yes, oh. she's like, "Accidents happen. It's okay." I'm like, "Deep breath. Oh. <laughs> You're right. It's okay. These clothes really don't matter. Like we're yeah. again safe and healthy." So she definitely does a great job of reminding me uh, to keep my emotions in check. Yeah, they really humble us, don't they? And yeah, this age too is, um, you're like coming up to three, which for me was a challenging, a challenging age. So yeah, keeping all of that in mind is so important. Betsy, I appreciate you joining us on the podcast so much. How can listeners connect with you and follow along with your journey to the Olympics? Yes, you can follow me on Instagram at Betsy Flint, B-E-T-S-I-F-L-I-N-T. I'm active there. If you have questions about anything, feel free to DM me and I will get back to you. Cool. And then where will we be able to kind of like keep up with your journey? Will you just share updates on your Instagram page or do you have a website that people should check out or how can we support you? Yeah, I will be on Instagram sharing updates and where to follow along. When we have tournaments coming up, I will post links where you can watch. And that is, yeah, the best place to find me. Okay, so cool. We'll we'll all be rooting for you. So thank you so much for joining and have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much for having me. This is awesome.